birthday celebration. Here we go. We're gonna. We, we're about to change the world right now. This is a paradigm shift and a vision that's gonna take everything that's happening to a whole new level. So I like to bring up Dylan Keg is a world class artist and designer with a profound interest in human health and ways in which people relate to one another. She studied under the tutelage of architectural innovator and visionary Michael Reynolds and graduated from the Earthship Academy in Tulsa, New Mexico. She then received a prestigious invitation to work for Biotexture at the Greater World Earthship Community. As a result, she traveled to Indonesia with Reynolds and his team as part of the first group of architects to begin construction of Earthship Island, which was intended to be a beacon of sustainability for the world. Dylan is also a former associate professor at Grenfell Campus Memorial University, a yoga instructor, outdoor adventurer, educator, culinarian, and practitioner of the mucusless diet. Without further ado, I give you Dylan Keg. Give it up. <laughs> You're mine now. <laughs> Welcome. Welcome. Really, this is very special. I, uh, I'm really happy to be here today. Happy, happy. My tail is wagging. <laughs> I'm uh, very excited to share this presentation with you. So can everybody, a little housekeeping here, can everybody see this screen? Raise your hand, I just wanna make sure. Thank you. And can everybody hear me? Raise your hand. Awesome, cool, great. I feel like I wanna play Simon Says. <laughs> All right, without further ado, Earth Ships, Regenerat regenerative, can anybody else say that? Regenerative? <laughs> Regenerative Living and Our Vision for an Arid Village. Um, yeah, it's, wow, it's been a long time coming this. The Art of Life. This is a, a phrase that I've been uh, throwing around for the past couple of years to try to encompass all of the different mediums that I work in. And I, I can't seem to do it, so I just use the word life. I work in so many different fields, and it's really, I don't like to be pigeonholed. I, I don't like to be labeled. Um, I just want to live. So these words help me uh, keep focused on, on what it means to really live for me, and I'm going to share them with you. The art of life is the conscious, co-creative, willful exploration of living including daily actions and lifelong projects with respect to community, mind, body, and soul. Yeah. Or some people, uh, they just call it the yoga lifestyle. <laughs> so on that note, um, I'd just like to take a moment before we start and, uh, and really check in with our breath. So wherever you are right now, however much room you have to move, just, we're gonna take in a big breath together with our arms. We're gonna move our arms in this movement. <clears throat> so breathing in, bring your arms out in front of you or out to the side, reach with the fingers, fill up the body with the breath, reach to the top. <clears throat> and then just let it go. And we're gonna do that two more times. All right, one more time, breathing in fully. Reach, 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 fill, fill, fill. <clears throat> Let that go in any way that feels good. One more time. This is the biggest breath you have taken all day. Breathe in, right in the belly, the ribs, and the chest. Pause at the top, and then just let it go, babies. Thank you. Excellent. All right. Whew. Yeah, the breath. It's all about the breath. Thank you. Your support has made it possible for me to introduce to you such a vision as this. 
a, but a slight disclaimer. Um, I want to be clear. <laughs> I have no illusions that I have all of the perfect answers. Uh, nothing I present here today do I consider to be the only way. <clears throat> Mr. Frank B. Cool Cag, <laughs> my father. I just can't even think of introducing this presentation today without mentioning him. Besides the profound love of architecture my sister, father, and I all share, Frank happens to be a bit of a character. <laughs> and uh, Don't let his gruff use of vernacular vocabulary fool you. Really, me and my sister believe he's a reincarnated Sufi in disguise. And he often shares many funny little succinct and ironic quips. <clears throat> One I would like to share with you today, although somewhat watered down uh, for this audience, mind you, and it, it goes like this. <laughs> you want to know my definition of an expert? Someone who has just mucked it up every which way possible. <laughs> yeah, I love this man. So by his definition, I am not an expert, but this man is. <laughs> yeah, Arnold Eret, the man we are here to celebrate today. Didn't Eret try everything before he decided he had failed so completely at healing that he, he decided to, to starve himself and die? He would rather die than live with the pain anymore. And only then, by accident, discovering his healing system. And still, after his many subsequent years of practice and refinement, perhaps not everything in his books is for certain. The point is that despite all those failures and uncertainties, he put his journey out there. And hasn't it helped heal and inspire countless thousands around the world? So, I dedicate this presentation to all those who have the kahunas to not just live despite their mistakes, but dare to have fun while they share them with the world. <laughs> so the vision. The rest of this presentation, I'm just going to intermingle with all kinds of thoughts and ideas and concepts that we could use. These are just tools in our toolbox, so to speak. All right. Anybody know who this is? This man's name is Paulo Soleri. He's a... He's known as an urban architect and philosopher. Uh, God rest his soul. So long before green buildings entered popular vocabulary, futuristic ego architect Paulo Soleri was pioneering his vision of an entire city structured with harmony in nature. And he called it arcology, the fusion of architecture with ecology. And they actually started... <laughs> yeah, they actually started building one of these things in the Arizona desert. And they called it Arcosanti. And this 50-year-old city of the future <laughs> never reached uh, the scale yet intended. Um, as you can see demonstrated by this model, the colored bits being what is there today and the entire thing intended for 5,000 people. It currently only habits about 100 odd people, give or take, at a time. It's uh, an extraordinary little spot, but this is what I, I really get excited about. Um, these vaults, they're just beautiful. They were built first so that the builders who would have shade from the, they would have shade from the sun. I don't know if you've ever been anywhere really, really hot and tried to like, you know, get a full work day in. But man, when we were in Indonesia, everybody was dropping like flies. And uh, yeah, no joke. This, this, this vault thing is an excellent plan. <laughs> and you could see how beautiful they are. Not just practical, it's inspiring. 
It's inspiring to be there. It's an aspiring space to meet in, to celebrate in, to just be in. Yeah. And then right in the back there, um, yeah, that's a workshop. That's a beautiful workshop. Giant workshop. <laughs> I want a nice big giant workshop like that. <laughs> and uh, here's a map. This will give you a little more um, relationship of, of things to each other. So those vaults. Are, uh, are right here. And this is the actual size of the workshop. So then you can see all kinds of other lovely stuff. We've got a huge amphitheater here. There's offices and uh, things around here. There's a pool. There's places for visitors to stay. There's a foundry, a ceramics workshop, a beautiful visitor center with a beautiful cafe. And this is all on top of a, an amazing outcrop, incredible vistas. So we could consider all of these kinds of things and how we want to lay them out. Uh, I know that Professor Spira has requested a sound recording studio. You know, what makes our heart sing? And then <laughs> here's another man contending for my dad's definition of an expert. <laughs> Does anybody know who this is? Ooh. Where's my, where's my man, obi -Kan? You, you, you know, no, yeah, 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 you've got a baby. This is, this is Michael Reynolds, yeah. The former architect, now original biotech, who, uh, who brought us Earthships. Yeah, he's, a, he's an architect, he's the founder and creator of Earthship Biotecture, uh, which today is an eco-construction company known worldwide. And after graduating from architecture school at the University of Cincinnati in 1969, concerned about a problem of trash and the lack of affordable housing, Michael started experimenting and building using discarded materials. And over the next decades, designs constantly evolved to respect the environment and counteract climate change through architecture. And, uh, I just, I gotta say this, Michael is certainly not the be all, end all of the human race. He's, he has his vices, and don't we all? I have personally experienced his less than socially capable moments, as have many others, but what I love about this man is that he keeps showing up anyway, despite his mistakes, and so has also had many successes, and we can learn a lot from both of them. I really like this description of Reynolds. It's typical, if nothing else. Here's Chris Moody reporting for the New Republic. When I arrived at the work site in January, the project was entering its third phrase, and Reynolds was balanced atop a six-foot wall of used tires wearing aviator sunglasses. He swung a sledgehammer into a beat-up Michelin full of dirt and crushed rock, his shoulder-length white hair falling onto a long sleeve shirt drenched in sweat. At 73, he's a rare breed. A combination of Captain Planet and Howard Rourke, the intransient architecture, architect in the fountainhead. Now you may have noticed this funny word, biotexture. And the word biotexture, being a play on the word architecture, is an attempt by Reynolds to articulate the difference between conventional buildings and giant machines that interface with the living world. So what does bio mean? According to Etymology Online, bio is a, a word-forming element, especially in scientific uh, compounds, meaning life, life and, or biology, bio biology and, or biological, or pertaining to living organisms and their constituents, from the Greek bios, one's life course, or way of living, a lifetime. So simply put, in my own words, I would say it like this. These buildings are designed from start, from the start, to support life, not take from it. And then there's this other funny word, <laughs> earthships. Who here has heard of earthships? 
Oh, yeah. That's fantastic. Wow, it's about half of you. That's amazing. Okay. So Earthships, this is the name that Reynolds came up with to call the actual buildings he makes. Um, Earthships being a metaphor uh, because like a ship out to sea, these, uh, these Earthships are totally self-sufficient and Earth is one of its key construction materials. But you also, you have to kind of sail the Earthship a bit, interacting with it for it to perform. So like opening and closing vents and that kind of thing and in order to make sure you have a nice comfortable temperature. But really succinctly put, leaving out all the hippie language, they really are just this. State-of-the-art, sustainable, off-grid buildings. It's uh, incredibly inspiring. Next up, this is a this is an Earthship at night, and uh, this is the same Earthship in the day. I'm just going to show you some images of Earthships. They can be uh, beautiful, huge, large mountain mansions, and this is uh, an interior greenhouse, and this is a school, a Waldorf school in South America. And they can be castles. <laughs> And then, you know, little tiny survival models. And uh, this is up in the mountains, and you can find them in the tropics. This is the one we built in Indonesia. And you can have all the amenities you want, including garages. And uh, yeah, beautiful, comfortable, inspiring, and how you like. So Earthships cover six human needs met by following six building principles. Food and energy or electricity and clean water, shelter and garbage management. This is a human need now and sewage treatment this is a human need. <clears throat> and so I'll just briefly state the, the principles, but I'm going to go into them in depth. So the first one is building with natural and repurposed materials. You can kind of see that uh, right down there in the, 
in the garbage management. And heating and cooling, heating and cooling through thermal mass, I'll get into that, to create a comfortable living environment without electricity. And using wind and solar energy or other ways to create electricity or harness things from the environment. Harvesting and filtering rainwater to provide drinking and wash water. Containing and treating its own wastewater without external contamination. And producing its own food in an integrated greenhouse. So let's, let's get into it. <laughs> Natural disasters strike and the power grid goes down and where I am from, storms frequently cause power outages, sometimes so severe that they last for a week. And a lonely elderly soul who can't get to a neighbor's place for one of a hundred thousand reasons I can think of, um, you know, can't get to a wood stove, ends up freezing to death. There's stories like this all over the world. An earth ship should maintain a comfortable temperature inside no matter the climate outside and should do so without electricity. This is an earth ship from outside and here's another one. And, uh, and this is a greenhouse, an earth ship greenhouse in Quebec, Canada. And just this Next slide is what it looks like inside. See outside right now? Are you paying attention? This is inside. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so how does an earth ship do this? Thermal mass. A stable year-round temperature is achieved because earth ships are built with a large thermal mass. Think of thermal mass as the opposite of insulation. It's more like a battery. Instead of trying to keep heat or cold in, a large amount of high mass, such as earth, is used to build the exterior and some interior walls. And wanting to find its equilibrium, the mass radiates heat when the surrounding air is cold and absorbs heat when it's hot. Additionally, no matter the supplementary mat built on mass, at a certain depth, the earth has a constant, more comfortable temperature that can be tapped into. The relatively large thermal mass of an earth ship versus heavy reliance on insulation is a major, if not the major difference between earth ships and conventional buildings. So I'll just use the pointer here for a second. So this earth down here and this mass right here, you can see how in the hot summer, the angle is such that it doesn't heat up in here. And in the winter, when you need it, it comes in and it heats up in here. Many people don't believe it. So an experiment was done in the middle of the night. All the windows and vents in an earth ship were opened until the internal temperature fell down to zero, but no further, because you know we don't want to kill the plants. <laughs> and then everything was closed all back up again, and within half an hour, the entire place was back up to a comfortable room temperature. And here you can see what the living space is like in relation to what's around it, including the thermal mass hidden behind and below the comfort zone it creates. Now, the thing is, what if you're in a climate where you don't get a lot of sun? If the sun can't heat the earth, how would we charge this thermal battery? Well, any supplementary form of heat could be used, such as a wood stove or a fireplace. And once the thermal mass is charged up, it will radiate heat all night. You don't have to keep feeding the fire, so much so that many people find themselves throwing their blankets off. Now, this is Earthship Island. <laughs> This is meant to be a beacon of sustainability to the world. And it's located on an island, off of an island, off of a bunch of islands called Indonesia. And uh, this is where I did my field studies. And I was responsible for heading up the bottle wall production while I was there. And we were the first team in, like Spira said. But it looked like this. There was nothing there. It was practically untouched. We camped. We built our own toilets. Yeah. So. 
Um, I'm just gonna do this little Earthship Island walkthrough with uh, Michael's voiceover. You'll get a sense of the building. And I know we're all interested in building in the tropics, so um, we could really consider something like this. This is a little walkthrough of what we're gonna do in Indonesia. This is what we just finished. Uh, what we're doing is three of these around a courtyard to make our headquarters there so we can have people have some accommodations while we develop this island. Um, you can see the tires going up and wrapped around the cisterns. Very simple, no half tires needed. Cooling tubes are going in. There's going to be a lot of them for natural ventilation. And then we get the uh, preparation for the vault. We have a new way of doing vaults now, and they work on the side of the tire wall rather than the top. You'll get to see all of this. We mesh the vault and get it cooked up to our cisterns, which have a bottle veneer. And then we start detailing the vault out with the ventilation and the plaster, and then the waterproofing, and then the insulation. Eight inches of rigid insulation goes on this thing. And then we have more waterproofing and the beginning of our breeze maker and just decorative urns out front. The framing for the bamboo veranda goes on and then the front and back arches and then we're getting ready to plaster our roof and get the final coat of cement on the roof with the ribs and there's the breeze maker framed up and metal coated and then the solar hot water heater goes in and the interior has three bottle walls and uh, door bucks built into the walls these projects are all going on at once and there's a lot to learn on this whole operation. The systems are built into the rear of the building and they will be taking you through each one of them. Then when the planters start growing and being used, the plants uh, treat the sewage and we end up with a building that produces plants while treating its sewage and keeping it from the coral. And we end up with a building that is uh, fully, fully sustainable and fully, fully safe for the coral and needs no infrastructure. This is the tropical model airship. And it has a little room inside with bed, couch, table, kitchenette, toilet, shower, all the amenities. Use your earphones and your computers and lights and um, stores about 6,000 gallons of water and ends up looking like this. Uh, come join us. So here, just a little still, I wanna get into the, um, to this thing up here, <clears throat> this convection engine. When it's hot outside, conventional concrete structures can get hot enough to fry an egg. Whereas an Earthship remains comfortable without electricity by utilizing uh, the following, this, uh, these convection engines up on the, the sun heats the vents, which are made of metal situated on the roof and, and hot air uh, rises, pulling the, the cold air up through the buried vents. And uh, the reality of how well this works was just phenomenal to me. Um, after we got the vault up with the, the vent in place, we had a meeting inside, packed, with the, packed the place. Everyone was in there and everyone agreed. It was easily, and I'm being generously conservative here, easily 10 degrees cooler than out in the sun. But you don't have to take my word for it. Direct quote from a journalist for the Jakarta Post in Indonesia. The building under construction is less than 20 degrees Celsius inside, while outdoor temperature, the outdoor temperature is unbearable. So moving on to the materials, <clears throat> the reclaimed and recycled materials. Earthship techniques have been a 40-odd year evolution, and of course, there are always ways to improve. And Michael's first idea to use recycled materials was this building block made of cans wired together, which is a little Easter egg for anybody who goes to the academy. You could find all these little Easter eggs in different Earthships. <laughs> and um, 
Yeah, but we don't bother wiring them together into blocks anymore. We just directly recycle discarded cans and bottles found around the area directly into the adobe or cement as filler. And eventually you won't see this garbage. These girls are, are helping veterans at Foxhole Homes build a survival model. Isn't that fantastic, having the kids involved? I just, I'm all about that. I find some kids more intelligent than some adults. <laughs> I don't know why that is, but maybe they're just open. Um, so God bless these girls and, and God bless Foxhole Homes for what they're up to. And uh, bottles and cans can also, though, be skillfully and artfully placed to create beautiful patterns and textures. And, and this is the castle where I stayed when I was in the academy. And it's actually one of the homes Michael designed and built for himself and lived in. He placed those cans himself there 30 years ago. You can see the texture on this side of the building there. And uh, here's some more examples. The Airship Academy building in New Mexico. It's perhaps about 20 years old or so. It's decorated with cans and bottles. And just behind it, you can see another newer Airship in the works. And this is Eve and the interior greenhouse of Eve. This is to be grown. This is new. There's going to be huge trees in here one day. But it's quite beautiful. And the more texturing with bottles, and there's no end to how creative you can get. You, you see the overlapping stuff uh, there above the windows. Uh, that is repurposed metal from old appliances like washers and dryers. <laughs> and bottles get cleaned and cut in half and matched together to make bricks, and they create these beautiful stained glass walls, and that's a lot of what I do. And I love this small and beautiful stained glass window. And it's, it's in one of my favorite Earthship bathrooms, in one of my favorite Earthship locations called Reach, located up in the mountains. And the view is incredible. I would love to spend some serious time in this bathroom doing an enema. An, an, <laughs> an, 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 <laughs> but uh, it was dangerous to build there. The road um, up is so steep that a truck carrying cement flipped back over on itself. And thankfully, no one was hurt. Um, but anyhow, I'm glad they made it up there. It's amazing. And this is another Earthship bathroom. I'm such a fan of bathrooms. And uh, this is another Earthship bathroom. This is the shower area in the newer Lone Tree uh, global model that my academy helped build. And bottle walls, having been what drew me to, uh, to Earthships as an artist in the first place, so this just so happens to be the first bottle wall I ever helped build. And, uh, and this is me with my, some Academy friends outside. And you can see that arch up there in the background. And uh, that's us. And little did I know at the time that I would be invited to, to build a bottle wall right there. And so this is the start. You can see the cans down in the cement and everything framed up here and uh, some progression photos. And uh, this is what it's like to stand under the work as it's progressing. It's, it's, you have to use a level to make it straight. Like it's, try, it's like trying to paint a mural up close. You can't really see what you're doing, right? It's amazing, though, an amazing experience. More progression shots. This is near finished. And so if you, if you remember this, this is the finished area. So. Like, as a designer, you know, trust me, <laughs> right? Yeah. Now, eventually Michael Reynolds started experimenting with what Earthships is, is most famous for now, earth rammed tires. And tires are a huge problem. Many countries don't know what to do with them. <laughs> some just shred them and ship them somewhere else. <laughs> and some just dump them, polluting our oceans or creating colossal piles like you see here. And tire walls in an Earthship, um, though, are not toxic and do not off-gas. This is an issue that many people bring up. And it's so ironic because conventional homes are, are made with materials that are infused with, with toxic chemicals. And I always air out the building I'm in, leaving the windows open, even in the winter, for at least a half an hour. Highly recommend that. Um, when uh, when tire piles catch fire, they cannot be put out. It can burn for weeks and months, causing serious pollution. And this cannot happen um, when they're actually buried in 
in the house. Houses that employ tire walls always apply a thick earthen or cement plaster over the tires, so, so there's no longer exposed to the atmosphere. And uh, the plaster helps make it fire resistant. And these homes actually meet, or I would say exceed, local fire regulations. There are definitely um, <laughs> firemen who, who build earthships <laughs> for a reason. Um, yeah, there's an example of, of a fire having swept through uh, the greater world and, and uh, the earthship was left standing. So, moving on, um, this is an example of a tire wall. And uh, their tires are such a, a huge part of the typical earthship that they are the main feature in the Academy logo. And this is, this is me on top of the first tire I ever pounded. <laughs> <laughs> I was so happy, and we took this, this photo from my GoFundMe campaign, and uh, what a time we had. It was a great day. And Here you can see uh, the tires in the background getting, uh, getting you know, put together correctly. And Michael claims in the Academy that they're the perfect building brick. He suggests even if you tried, you couldn't come up with something better, and here are some reasons why. When packed with earth, the tires expand and they lock into each other. Um, and of course, as mentioned, this otherwise dangerous garbage is then recycled, a huge boon to the environment. Um, they create super strong walls that are their own foundations. I was shown a picture of a tractor driving over an earthship. Old tires are used. They are done curing, so there is no off-gassing to worry about. And regardless, they are sealed inside the walls with adobe or cement. And uh, in order for the tires to break down, they would have to be exposed to extreme sunlight or lots of water. And if that is happening inside your walls, you have bigger problems than smelling old tires. And so these packed tires, um, as cited, harbor no oxygen, so they don't burn. Special, ex yeah, special expensive large machinery and equipment, um, which some other building methods employ, such as compressors and air and forklifts, aren't always available everywhere in the world, especially in the midst of disaster relief efforts. But tires are plentiful, abundant, everywhere you go. There are so many tires now that they have become, Reynolds suggests, an indigenous building material, <laughs> common to the whole of Earth. And always a great reason to do something, you save money, because being considered garbage, they don't cost anything, and they're free. Pounding tires is time and labor intensive. It can easily take two people 15 minutes to pound one tire, and some people are very intimidated by that. And despite Michael's above justifications for considering tires, it's certainly one of the things one has to consider when building an Earthship or an Earthship-inspired building. But if a 70-odd-year-old man does it on the regular, then there must be more to it than just hard work. It certainly is a productive way to exercise a few demons, but Michael also talks about how there's something really wonderful about people coming together to pound tires. And I happened to discover while, while pounding my first tires that there were a few other Glee Club fans in my academy, and we just had a great time breaking out into song while we worked. And it's, it's one of my favorite memories. And, but that said, people are experimenting with faster ways to work with tires. So if one has access to electricity, uh, a mnemonic tamper can pound one within five minutes. Five minutes, not bad. This though, there are other ways of recycling tires as building blocks are also being experimented with. Um, tires can be compressed into these giant bales, tire bales. And here's a few images of those. You can see how big in comparison to a flatbed truck. Now, 
foxhole homes. You heard me mention them before. A sustainable housing community for veterans in need has been working towards building Earthship-inspired homes with tire bales. Ted Brunegar, founder and CEO, states they expedite the building process, placing the bales for a normal size home in a single day while recycling exponentially more tires. And this past December 2018, he gave us an exciting update about their first experiment in building with tire bales. He had two people um, completed a 100 foot by five foot wall with a forklift in just 4.5 hours. Yeah. And here's Ted, Ball, here's Ted, God love him, of Foxhole Homes, looking proud in front of that wall alongside uh, Ron and his wife Kristen uh, of Earthship Biotexture. And these are three good hearted sustainable building folks vying for my dad's definition of an expert. Energy harnessing systems. You can see a wind turbine here. And uh, here you can see uh, the, solar, the solar cells are up here. And uh, micro hydro, I'm not going to go into this too much, but it's worth mentioning that places with abundant sources of water could experiment with micro hydro. Um, it's similar to wind. Uh, you just use water to turn the turbine. And I have experience with this at the Tree of Life Sustainability Project um, Retreat Center in Newfoundland. And so, uh, yeah, just to quote uh, Ian on that, um, yeah, microhydro can produce about 1,000 watts during peak performance. Another way of putting this is um, that 1,000 watts of output is like working with 24 kilowatt hours, and uh, an average householder on the grid is using 36. Um, there's a, a chap named Paul Cunningham in Sussex, New Brunswick, and uh, he's been manufacturing beltless micro turbines for decades and selling them all over the world. And he has manuals on how to set up gravity-based systems that are, that are excellent. So, oh, yeah, graphene. Who here has heard of graphene? Just raise your hand. Wow. Yeah, like crickets out there. Okay, all right. Yeah, get ready. Get ready. If you haven't heard of it, uh, get familiar. Pretty soon you're going to be seeing the name everywhere. It's, okay. <laughs> it's, this still blows my mind. It's 200 times stronger than the strongest steel lighter than any other material known, the thinnest compound ever discovered, and one of the best conductors of both heat and room uh, temperature and electricity. Uh, amongst the phenomenal possible applications in construction, biomedicine, textiles, and computing, etc., it's expected, this is where it's relevant right now, to greatly improve battery capabilities and lifespan, and, it, you know, Sustainable buildings, um, batteries are a major cost when we're considering our energy harnessing systems budget. So it could radically simplify um, the battery situation. It's also, okay, watch this video. It could simplify solar electricity. Check this out. So graphene paint is like any other paint that you're familiar with. The idea is that you have a coating on a material and that coating protects and changes the property of the material. For example, we're looking at adding graphene to traditional paints or ship hulls where the graphene helps stop the salt go from the seawater to the metal hull and rust that hull. However, looking ahead beyond that, we're looking at exciting applications such as the idea of painting a solar cell onto a home using graphene and other 2D materials and that then being able to power the home through a simple paint of the roof. Yeah, exactly. There's so much to be excited about with graphene. I'm going to mention it a few other times later in the presentation. Um, water. Water is a big deal in places that don't have a lot of it. Um, regardless, we can collect our own water. There is no need to depend on infrastructure. Um, estimates vary, but each person in the U.S. uses about 800 to 100 gallons a day. But in this infographic, um, it suggests even more. It says 136 gallons a day. And so just compare that to Earthship water use. In one case study, a four-person household averaged out to just 14 gallons per person per day. 
We can harvest water in so many ways, from rain or snow on the roof, freshwater rivers or lakes. Some people have a well, some harvest dew or a fog. Even seawater could potentially be filtered through graphene. <laughs> yeah, waste systems. Gray and black water systems. No need to hook up to infrastructure to get rid of anything either. Gray and black water recycle um, that so-called wastewater. It's excellent news if water is short, but if not, I still recommend considering one of the following systems. That water you wash in and flush away often is left raw and just pollutes the rivers and the oceans. It's extremely gross. I don't think we're civilized as long as we're doing that. Whereas um, such things are actually really valuable. Um, gray water, such as what you wash your hands and food and clothes with, can be collected and fed directly to indoor planters. And you can also have um, a worm farm along the way, making use of their castings, which create a superfood for plants. And black water is, um, well, the gray water then cycles through to flush the toilet and then becomes black water. And black water is then cycled out to exterior treatment cells and gardens. That's in a typical earth ship. And this is a, a banana tree growing from an indoor gray water planter. All of these plants are uh, indoor gray water planters. And, and this is the phoenix. It's an earth ship. Um, and you can just see how big and beautiful the, uh, the colossal indoor greenhouse is. And, and this plan, uh, you can see how the whole front building of it is, is a greenhouse. It's incredible. This, okay, so last fall I was visiting the Omega Center, the Omega Institute in uh, Rhinebeck, New York for a conference, and I got to see firsthand from the inside out one of the world's greenest buildings. This is the Omega Center for Sustainable Living. Um, it's basically their sewage treatment plant. Um, internationally recognized, this is the first building ever to achieve both LEED Platinum and Living Building Challenge certification, the highest environmental performance standards available. And it looks like an earth ship, doesn't it? <laughs> Basically, all the gray and black water from the entire campus is cycled through here and uh, fed back out into the, the plants that you can, well, you can't really see in this slide, but there's tons here and inside here. When I visited, the jungle was huge. So this, this shot must have been taken when it was first, first built. Amazing building, incredibly beautiful. All of Omega has principles that we could consider checking into. They, they really are not into uh, to anything but life. They want everything they do to respect life around them. They go as slow as they need to in order to do that. Fast is not an excuse. Um, so this is the Omega Center campus map, just again to kind of give us some ideas of how we could lay things out. Thousands of people travel through here every year. and. Um, you can note that they have all kinds of lovely little public buildings for performances, lectures, yoga, dorms for visitors, uh, separate from staff facilities and offices. And they have a library, it's beautiful, and a huge dining hall that boasts a farm to table produce, and gorgeous nature trails. All of this is within a beautiful forest and access to a freshwater lake with a beach. You can go relax there and swim there. And, yeah, okay, so this is big. Um, instead of uh, black water, we can actually harness biofuel. Liquid and solid wastes are separated. The liquid waste being a kind of liquid gold can still be considered you know, a black water and it can, it can be uh, sent outside to, to plant cells. But the solids are cycled out to a biodigester digester, uh, which collects the biogas, uh, which can then be used for cooking or heating your water. And this plan um, for the dining hall of a sustainably planned orphanage and community in Africa includes a diagram of, of how this could work. So I don't know if you can see that really clearly, but um, yeah, so there's the waste and it's collected here and the gas collects here and then you just pipe it to where you need it. Like so here in the kitchen you would send it for your cooking. 
And uh, yeah, most people are somewhat familiar with compost. A compost toilet inside or outside of the house doesn't use water at all. They do not smell if used properly. It's easy. Each time you do your business, you just completely cover it with a layer of sawdust. And this can be taken uh, then to a compost outside the house. Or as we did in Earthship Island, we dug a cell. And then that became an outdoor bathroom that will become a future planter. And if the compost is done correctly, it gets up to temperatures that destroy all of the pathogens, um, according to Raw Life Health Show, um, who cites this book, The Humanure Handbook. And this means that unlike the black water systems I cited in the, the earthships, it can be used to grow produce that you can eat. And this is a, a great little diagram from that book illustrating uh, this principle. On the left, we have a conventional society. The cycle is broken and sick. And on the right, it's intact and it's healthy. Food, beautiful, beautiful produce. <clears throat> the kinds of food one can grow in our ship are quite varied. Fruit trees of many kinds have been successfully matured. And um, this is a, uh, while at the academy, I was treated to an Earthship banana <laughs> fertilized with gray water. Other common uh, products in Earthships are tomatoes and lettuce, grapes, peppers, eggs, plants, figs, lemons, limes, orange trees. And it, I just want to mention that detoxifying plants um, such as spider plants and bamboo plants and philodendron and these aloe plants, <clears throat> they've been shown to do really well on the gray water planters and they've been proven to remove chemicals from the air, like benzene, and I can't pronounce the tri low, I can't pronounce this one, but formaldehyde, et cetera. And uh, so basically the house, because of its water conservation feature, it, it literally grows fresh air. And herbs for healing and natural pesticides, of course. Um, so if you're down in the tropics, you might, we might want to look into this. Plants that re repel mosquitoes, citronella, and a lot of herbs that we, we use for healing um, naturally repel insects. And uh, this, I can't imagine building a place, um, a sustainable building, in a, in a planned community without considering the surrounding land that this community will reside in. And so I mean, this is a huge topic in and out of, of itself, but directly related in that the larger design then informs how and where community buildings and spaces and industries would go. So this would be the first thing. We don't build the buildings and then think about the space around us. We think holistically first from the get-go. And this simplified diagram, we have um, the people in the center, and then in zone zero, the house or settlement, followed by zone one, the frequently visited kitchen or garden, all the way out to the, to the zone five, which is the unmanaged wilderness zone, foraging, inspiration, and meditation. And uh, this is another example of how a community plans to incorporate sustainable living design. You can see the um, the fish farming and um, agroforestry and yeah, do you remember that um, the biodigester I showed you in the dining hall? So that that building is right down here in a flower of life design. This is an orphanage in Africa. Beautiful project. So back to foxhole homes again. Another aspect of this project that I really like is that right from the start, they have planned their community amidst what they call a regenerative farm. And their earthship inspired buildings being just one tool that helps them meet its objective for a healthy community. And here's what they have to say about regenerative agriculture. Like a person who is thriving, a regenerative farm is doing more than just getting by. This is important because we're dealing with living things and real people. Someone on life support is sustained, but a healthy person regenerates, heals from wounds, overcomes sickness, and is able to exercise and work. And therefore, we strive to do more than merely sustain people and productive systems. We seek to continuously enhance them. 
Um, the way this, the designed ecology has resilience to create abundance, even if we're not able to actively manage each aspect. So, you know, if you get sick, if you can't get up, you can't do anything, the whole, the whole system isn't going to fall apart. It, it takes care of itself if we design it properly. And then we just go in and, and manage from time to time. So infrastructure, earthworks, trees, animals, everything works together. Desirable products are encouraged. Undesirable results are discouraged. And species selection and development is extremely important. You wouldn't ask a lap dog to pull a sled through the Yukon or cows to sniff out drugs. We choose the plants and animals that are predisposed to do what needs to be done. And this kind of agriculture is inspired by and we'll incorporate such tools as, I'm just gonna throw some words out there, permaculture, water retention landscapes, food forest, agroforestry, silvio pasture, non-timber forest products, agriculture, um, sorry, aquaculture, aquaponics, and paddock shift livestock management. I, I suggest we consider the same. And uh, so remember Earthship Island, here's the ground plan of that tropical survival model, just to give you some ideas of uh, kind of how things could go with the actual buildings. And here's an example of, of how they could be combined to create a little mini protective courtyard. And um, same thing here and on a larger scale. And uh, this is what it could look like um, cultivated on the island in the end. And uh, yeah. So, just like the physical land around the community is to be considered, so is the, the state, country, political landscape. Just because natural law doesn't need someone to write it down in order to make it true, doesn't mean that people don't create codes of conduct. Or when in states of fear, thinking themselves to not have enough, partake, in corruption of all sorts. It's gonna be happening around us. So when I asked Earthship Biotexture for recommendations on tropical locations close to the states, uh, where we might find a local culture and politics to be in our favor, instead of something we would have to fight against continuously. I mean, it can, paperwork, <laughs> red tape, it can, it can suck your life away. Um, I'd rather be jumping in the ocean and swimming and playing and hanging out. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I was told that Puerto Rico is top of the list. Well, we don't have to go there, but I'm just throwing that out there as a possibility. So, um, here's what Earthships is up to in Puerto Rico. I'm going to turn the sound right down to start, and here we go. People in Puerto Rico face many island challenges. Expensive food source, lack of electricity. When they have no electricity, all their houses are very hot. They have no refrigeration and no water. These challenges are perpetuated by an inadequate US government and natural disasters. What we're doing here is to show an example where all these challenges are met and create a self-reliant existence for the people of Puerto Rico. Island issues are the same issues that the world faces, but it's much more apparent when you're on an island of what these issues are. There's no solution to any of the garbage created on this island. It just piles up and piles up and is stored until eventually shipped off island or dumped. Uh, here we're presenting an example of what to do with that garbage and how to uh, effectively contribute to the island cleanup, uh, all the while building hurricane resistant structures. While working here, it's super apparent that the people of Puerto Rico are treated as second-class citizens by the U.S. government. As they don't pay income tax but huge tariffs, the government feels no need to support public projects, schools, health care, etc. Creating self-reliant housing can lift people from the dependence on an unreliable U.S. government.
just a few diagrams. This is kind of similar to what they were up to there. You can see uh, from the air, and this is the side, the water collection system. And um, then we get into uh, harnessing that water then for the gray and black water for showers and toilets. And again, here's a, what you saw in the, in the video just there, the wind protected courtyard in the center. Uh, really beautifully done, and you know you can do anything with these things. You could you could pair them up, and you could you know scale it up as large as you like. Well, what does it cost? <laughs> That's a bit of a trick question. <laughs> Is anybody familiar with this this concept, this diagram? This was introduced to me many years ago in my in my studies for theater, film, and television. Uh, how to, it's a great way to, to manage a project, uh, to approach budgeting in a project. So here's the thing, you can only pick two. You want good and cheap, and you can't have fast. You want fast and good, and you can't have cheap. <laughs> um, but here are some numbers to dial you in a little bit more to, to what it costs. So first to build. Um, yeah, so the Phoenix, <laughs> it's gorgeous, and you too can have it for $1.5 million. <laughs> the global model, uh, Reynolds teaches that one of the best reasons for building this airship is that it doesn't cost any more than it would for you to build an equivalent conventional house with all of its amenities. So according uh, to an article from archina.com by Rachel um, Prinz, if you can perform 100% of the work and obtain all the products yourself, $150 per square foot will get you a bare bones or ship in the US. And this cost uh, goes up depending on how craftsmanship challenged you are. Um, it will cost you $225 per square foot to have Earthship Biotexture build your Earthship. And the survival model, there's all kinds of numbers with this. The app says uh, 12,500 to 20,000, depending on the type. But when I asked someone in New Mexico what it was actually costing them while they were building it, they answered with something shocking like $80,000. But there's good news. Remember Foxhole Homes? <laughs> well, the Earthship Inspired Survival Model uh, Tiny House with limited systems, first dem their first time trying this out. Um, they got their build cost to under six grand. Um, and that was with volunteer labor. So if you repurpose a lot and have simple systems, uh, you can have it for $20 per square foot. And if you use fancier materials, robust redundant systems, and pay someone else to do all the work, it could cost you 200 a square foot. So that's to build, to operate. The upseller for all of these kinds of buildings um, being that once they're finished, there are no costs associated with being locked into the grid. So actually operating an Earthship shouldn't cost you a lot. Um, if anything, again, depending on how much you've invested into your systems and are you using gas for cooking instead of recycling your waste for biofuel, etc. So a specific example, um, uh, in New Mexico is $300 for a family of four per year. Minus the fact that they get over 1,000 per year of produce from the water treatment planters within the home. So at that point, the house functionally pays them to live there. <laughs> now, this guy, Robert Murray Smith, um, so as mentioned, buildings and technologies are constantly evolving to become more effective and financially feasible. Uh, concrete is often used in otherwise environmental buildings as a last resort. So anything that would make using less of it a reality should garner attention in this industry. Remember that super strong wonder material called graphene? Well, Mr. Smith has been playing around with all kinds of graphene applications, including a graphene and concrete composite and according to the, an independent testing house in the UK, one test block came out to a whopping 58% stronger than normal concrete, and Robert's team say they still think they can get a stronger formulations. It's mind-blowing. And 
Then there is graphene in aircrete. Aircrete is already an exciting material in its own right that I would like, to, I would like us to consider using it. And this is why I'm going to show you a video about it in a moment. Um, but if structurally reinforced aircrete can cut costs of conventional methods of construction by a factor of 10, so instead of one dome, you have 10 domes, um, what could graphene-infused aircrete do? It's an exciting time to be alive, folks. So here's a video uh, by Dome Gaia introducing Aircrete. Aloha. I'm Hajar Gibran. I'm the creative director of the Gibran Center. While I was building the Gibran Center in Thailand, I developed an innovative way of building low-cost dome homes. Maybe you've seen pictures on our website or the articles or YouTube by my buddy Steve Arene, who dome home we built at the Gibran Center. This is it right here, actually. With Steve's artistic genius and our two skilled Thai masons, Dao and Dome, we were able to build this unique dome home for less than $9,000. We've been swamped with requests from people all over the world, so I'm making this video to share some of our methods with you. After we develop a floor plan and elevation drawings on paper or on computer, then we drive a steel pipe in the ground. We set up a pole, the length of the dome's radius, that pivots around the center of the dome. We use it to lay out the foundation and later to accurately place the bricks, blocks, or whatever you choose to use. You could, like Mike Reynolds, reuse cans or turn old bottles into jewels. Then we build forms to support the arches, windows, and doorways. Once they are in place, we use the pole to lay the bricks. To stop the bricks from falling as they lean in, we use counterweights suspended over the outside of the dome. Our first domes were made with clay bricks and cinder blocks, which offer poor insulation or ecological value. In my search for better materials and easier methods, I explored the use of adobe, cob, compressed earth, earth bag, hemp, and even recycled polystyrene. I was at a loss until I discovered a material I'd never even heard of before, yet many environmental architects consider it to be the building material of the future. Aircrete is a lightweight masonry product that is infused with tiny air bubbles, which expands its volume many times. It provides good thermal and acoustic insulation. It's fireproof, waterproof, and impervious to insects, including termites. Made of completely recyclable, non-toxic, non-corrosive materials, it will not rot, warp, or mold. Unlike concrete, which is hard, heavy, cold, and difficult to work with, Aircrete is easy to work with. It dries overnight to a density similar to wood. It can be cut, carved, drilled, and shaped with woodworking tools. It accepts nails, screws, and is easily repaired. And because its primary ingredient is air, it's eco-friendly and inexpensive to produce. Aircrete is simply a mixture of water, ordinary cement, which is made of powdered limestone, and a water-based lather that looks like shaving cream. You need a foaming agent and a foam generator to produce the thick lather, and a special mixer to fold the lather into the mixture. Commercial equipment is heavy and costly, thus aircrete has been mostly limited to industrial use. With the help of my genius son, Joel, who's the CEO of his company, Infinite Automations, we developed an inexpensive do-it-yourself foam generator that works famously with ordinary dish detergent as the foaming agent. Then we invented a compact, lightweight, continuous mixer powered by an electric drill. This little machine replaces the heavy equipment that costs tens of thousands of dollars. And where conventional equipment only produces one batch at a time, our little machine is amazing. It will produce over 10 gallons per minute all day long with ease. We also created a special tubing bender for making forms. Our forms are made of inexpensive and easily accessible materials that can be reused over and over again. You simply pour in the liquid aircrete and let it harden overnight. 
The material cost for an arch like the one pictured is about $75. The material for a bare aircrete dome home like Steve's is less than $2,000, and that includes the foundation and the subfloor. Arches transform the awkward curvature of a dome into flat, vertical surfaces that are more practical for windows, doors, closets, furniture, etc. They also make it easy to connect different sizes of domes in countless configurations. Flat, rectangular blocks require a lot of extra labor and materials to smooth over, so we developed a way of casting larger aircrete blocks that already have the curved shape of the dome. This, of course, saves time and money. Oh my god, it's so light! And we plan to make it even more efficient. We're developing reusable forms to cast an entire dome. We'll cover a bent steel skeleton with thin wood slats woven like a giant hat covered with a waterproof fabric. It will imprint a beautiful design on the interior of the dome ceiling. The days of building with old growth timber are sadly over. 80% of our global forest ecosystems have already been destroyed, yet we have a growing need for housing. We've developed a truly revolutionary system. Fast, easy, and elegant aircrete structures answer the need for high-quality, low-cost housing everywhere. With our equipment and basic training, you too can have a solid, eco-friendly, insulated, waterproof, fireproof, insect-proof, non-toxic, beautiful, permanent home that makes your heart smile. This project is a collaboration between many of my friends, family, and all of us at the Gibran Center. If you like it, then click the like button, spread the word to your community, share it on Facebook, and please sign up for one of our perks. Mm. Yeah. <sighs> Beautiful. So, what could a healing community of mucusless diet practitioners who help teach the world how to live a mucus-free lifestyle look like? Ultimately, it looks like, <laughs> I'm not trying to be dramatic here, <laughs> us, <laughs> community. It's the people that make a place. We can destroy it or we can regenerate it. It's a choice everywhere we go. A conscious, co-creative, willful exploration of living with respect to community mind, body, and soul. And in closing, I will leave you with this quote from Dome Gaia. Art is love made visible. The end. Come on, let's hear it for Dylan Kay. Wonderful job, wonderful job. The revolution will not be televised, yes. 